be uh, based on the activities in my lab, but of course the, the recent work for just over a year and published a very modeling with the interaction with the will dominate most of the uh, material I covered, but uh, we'll have virtual glimpses of uh, one which we have been tracking in the lab a few things earlier, and I think that. So I, I put this as my goal statement uh, when uh, the lab responded about to get back that uh, uh, we are trying to find new computational frameworks, models, and algorithms using human visual perception to the image analysis vision in my uh, prime interest, and as well as vision to solve complex like problems in most updates in understanding, as well as uh, realism, visual realism, and visualization. So, uh, my focus of work can be brought into two parts. It's a little bit maybe on the left hand side, where we try to understand the image contents from image and video. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk mostly on this today. Excuse me for this uh, acronym High Resolution Microscopic Scans. Uh, you won't know if I hear, but uh, other than that, we'll also talk a little bit about uh, video retrieval, uh, video. Uh, categorization as well as face uh, based recognition uh, of the users, which was partly mentioned that, of course, in the past, we also and currently been working on the visualization, tracking from video, uh, saliency to music, and this as well. A lot of work with uh, uh, defense, autonomous uh, GIS, and other forms of learning like transfer learning. <coughs> On the other side, there's a little of work based on my interest on some of the top video based rendering, uh, human locomotion. I think I'm going to just show some glimpses of the results of maybe one, two, and three, and not discuss much here. We'll spend more than a time on this because that's what we did here, and maybe a couple of uh, uh, things of what we do with video and faces. Okay, so the current work, what we are doing with uh, data given by Martha, excuse me, I was very poor in life sciences and biosciences. So if you have any um, questions about what is GFP and the proteins and the hepatic neurons, Jeff is here and Park is there, the guy I work on that. Yeah, so these are just um, introduction to how the data is obtained uh, from the mouse scans. And there are two types of scans which have been provided to the, uh, our group by part of one is we call as the GFP or the person scans in short and other new type of scans. Uh, provided by this lab here, and right now we are working on trying to take these cells in two dimension. In the future, we will be trying to look at three dimensional structures, connectivity patterns, in space dimension, and so forth. Okay, I'm sorry for the illusion. Can we have these lights off interactive? All of them, it should be a master switch somewhere. Just reserve it. Ah, thank you. Yeah, uh, this uh, doesn't look uh, that. Well, it's just one of those scans, typically. But this is of 18K cross 24K size in terms of resolution. And if you actually try to zoom in, well, you won't see much at this because this is the, the zoom in by Bill Gates. So we actually take the zoom in scans in the next slides. And these are certain different sections of that large brain scans. So there are certain parts of the brain where there is very sparse set of cells, very easy to detect them. This is at, actually don't need uh, much of background. Uh, this is moderate density uh, where there are a couple of cells overlapping here and there, and there are some complex parts where there are actually lots of cells overlapping. We struggle 90% of the time to identify the cells here in this particular case, and that's the one which we will take as a case study for the next few minutes to understand what we did in an unsupervised framework to detect the cell patterns. And the primitive version of the work has appeared in a November 2016. Uh, neuroscience meeting workshop with Dr. Jay presented and we are trying to make a full version of the paper out of that uh, and we will see that um, getting results out of these are sub problems of this. Okay, so let's take one example and see what we did. Uh, this is an unsupervised method, there is no training but of course some little bit of empirical play around was done here and there over a few months to uh, over over two students to get the results. So this was the same scan which we saw here in the miniature uh, form. And then we just take the green channel out, segment it by a simple k-means clustering algorithm to get the foreground layer out of this. You can see that of course there are some backgrounds which are light green and black, they're just thrown out by this. And then you need to detect the cells here. So we took the edge map as a typical example. And those who are used to the image analysis uh, 
thing. You know, once you get the edge map, it gives lots of information. So the first thing we did was uh, uh, took the distance transform, which is uh, let me avoid the uh, uh, definitions of some of these. Uh, you can look into our paper or send me an email. Uh, this is a distance transform image of or a scan or a map of obtained from this edge map. And once you get the distance transform map, we uh, compute what are called ridge lines on top of that. Uh, if you look at this map, they will look as if it's a small type of a terrain which is passing through, or even it could probably look almost similar to a blood vessel, which could be uh, a scan of a blood vessel. And in fact, this uh, method is not ours. We took this uh, code and the a formulation of one of the papers which was actually detecting blood vessel uh, in the scan and that gave us this. So this was a good uh, point where we reached because what we found out is that uh, from this if we look at certain junctions which we call as bifurcations, the word bifurcations comes out of my earlier experience of working with fingerprint scans for recognizing human beings uh, in, in the field of biometry. So we looked at peaks of these which are actually coinciding mostly with these bifurcations or junctions. Uh, we use the word bifurcations at peaks and this gives us an initial set of uh, cell locations. Uh, on here we'll show the results but these are the initial set of cells which we identified which we say as peaks on DT or distance time. Simplest simple form. But this uh, was not the full, it was missing a few cases. For example, if you ask me, these two cells are widely separated out, there should be a cell in the middle, otherwise you cannot have that path in between. So what we did was we went back to this edge image, okay, and we traced through that to locate convex arcs. To do that, what we first did is we found some zero crossing markers. So we look at curvature as we move along that, and there are standard computational geometry or graphics um, uh, concepts to find out zero crossing markers where the curvature changes sign from zero to positive to negative. And uh, using the zero crossings, we found out what are convex arcs. You can see some of these convex arcs here. They will actually help you to find out cell locations if they are missed in this map. So this was another set of results. So we were able to put some cells here initially and look at the vacant places and then start doing the same thing, you know, and start putting cells iteratively. So we took the results of this and this and combined them using a small algorithm, which I'm, I'll skip for the sake of time. Uh, and this is our final output of the set of uh, cell bodies uh, on this particular map. We'll compare it with the ground truth, which we had uh, done with the help of cell annotators. But before that, we'll quickly go through the algorithm for which the, this is the illustration. So this was the sequence of image analysis steps, smoothing, thresholding, edge detection, distance transform, estimate uh, ridge lines, and then identify peaks and bifurcations. Then in parallel, what we did is we took the edge uh, we took the thresholded map and find out areas which had large foreground. We took the zero crossings of the edges and fitted circles on convex arcs and fill the rest of the portions iteratively, combine this by merging the clusters. Even after doing so, we found that there were a few vacant spaces available in the foreground layers. We identified them, started filling them iteratively. So there are a couple of iterations here which actually took time. Otherwise, the entire method is unsupervised. It required a few fine tuning of the variables and the union of this and that gave the final set of centers, okay? So that was the ground truth. Uh, this ground truth was done. You saw that initial brain scan. So there were uh, 250 cross 2, about 500 such brain scans, each of 18 k cross 24k size, manually annotated for a period of about, about a year, which was a little bit longer than what we would have liked to. Uh, but did this give us uh, a good thing that we can evaluate our algorithm now, or anybody in fact can evaluate our algorithm because the ground truth algorithm data is being released to the world. Uh, so this is the ground truth. This is the arc based filling. This is the distance transform. Intermediate results here. The final result is here because it's just not a simple union of that because something happens iteratively here as well as there and then they're combined in union to good. This. So you can see that this is very close to this. Of course, there are some errors here and there, uh, but uh, the, the cell body bodies which are located here are very similar to that obtained by the ground truth. And the final result which we got on two such typical brains of uh, these many scans was about 95 percent and 6 percent. Uh, uh, and we're trying to make a paper out of that. Uh, the pressure and recall values are standard retrieval uh, methods by which uh, I mean, retrieval tasks are measured. <clears throat> Few more results of simple cases. Uh, in the simple case, what we do is we go back to the algorithm. Actually, this particular branch itself will do the task when you have non-overlapping cells of these type of cases. Because you don't need the sophisticated. This, this will zip through. Uh, okay. So that was the first part. 
<laughs> the second part, we have a poster, so I'm using the next one minute of the poster. I'm a co-author of one of the papers, uh, the, the first poster of the poster session here, where I'm not going to describe this work. Please come back, visit our poster. The, the corresponding students will be there. So this is uh, the other type of a scan, although Partha said I should have taken a better scan because this is some damage here and stuff like that. So I'll probably correct myself next time. Okay. And I'm going to just show the results and not discuss about the method. Okay, so if you zoom in, you won't get much. So better what we did is we took small, small sections. We, we just named the word tiles. You know, when you put floor tiles, so you consider this as tiles. So you can see that the pattern is now very, very different than the fluorescent scans or GFP scans. And these are some of the results. So I'm jumping to the results. So please visit our poster and uh, request you again. <laughs> the scan, this is the ground truth, manually labeled. We have done for a few, not extensively like the GFE. So the next semester we'll be starting this in the, uh, the, 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 the manual annotation of a lot of these scans. This is the result of an unsupervised method, courtesy one of our interns who were successful in doing that. She'll be also here. She is in fact here. And this is the result of a deep learning method. Okay, this is the result of a deep learning method. So you can see that these results are very close. If you look at the ground truth versus uh, the deep learning as well as the unsupervised, they're very correct. Let's look at performance measures. I'm sorry, before that, these are, these are the labeled examples where these are the positives are in green. There are a few misses in red, not much visible, but there are a lot of false alarms in blue here and there. Uh, yeah, this is another example. Yeah, this is what it is. So the unsupervised is in fact performing almost equal to two different type of deep networks. The deep networks are not performing that well. Uh, the reason which I think is that we need a lot more training data. So we have only a few hundred, not sorry, not few tens of uh, scans uh, annotated for the ground truth and part of that we're using for training, part of that for testing. The unsupervised is really well, okay? Uh, so the co-workers for the entire task of this brain modeling over two has been one of my ex-dual students, Giraj is the project staff here, Madhavi is an intern, and Dr. Jay and Partha are here. So that's with respect to this. So give me five minutes to just go through the remaining part of my presentation, and I don't think I need more. So this is a work which we have been doing for the last few years on trying to recognize uh, individuals from surveillance cameras, okay? and uh, when I mean surveillance cameras is these uh, picture are for two different subjects. So this is a subject on the left hand side sitting in the laboratory like a passport control environment room and then you have a gallery as what is called a mock shot. And then the same person, of course this is a different guy, um, walks in front of the BSB computer science department corridor. So can you identify if you are given a mock shot from the face given here. So what's the problem? The problem is the following. The mock shots appear very clear like these for two different individuals. And we're going to crop out the face using popular Viola Jones type of a face detector. They were used to the biomet field of biometry and FR will know that. This is how the small miniaturized um, um, shot, uh, the, the, the samples will look like. So you're supposed to recognize the individual from this small image here. If you want to tell me what's the size, this is about 200 cross 200. Please correct me, my work is here. And this is about 30 cross 30. So the resolution gap is about six to seven times. Okay, the same. So this is another example of gallery of mug shots and the corresponding people. So these have been coming out of the surveillance cameras which are installed, were installed, they're not working anymore, but in front of our building. So the first thing we try to do is lay face recognition framework by just super sampling this using uh, some methods of super resolution. But as you can see that when you try to do super resolve, the images are of very low quality. They have aliasing artifacts and stuff like that. They did match, but the performance were just around 60 or 70 and all that. So uh, we have been trying over the last few years to match these images with these images and we uh, published a few conference papers on detecting and identifying faces from surveillance cameras, okay? So I'm not going to details about this method. I'll skip this slide or maybe later I'll, uh, I'll come. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. So these um, are uh, the results of uh, our database. This is an in-house database which we have. In fact, there are three such surveillance camera databases, two abroad, one in China, one probably Europe or Canada, and the third one in IIT Madras. Here, we have a small, slightly less number of, uh, in terms of its size, we have just uh, the faces of about 51 subjects, whereas those which are abroad about, about 80 or 100 or so. Uh, so we are showing the results of our database. So this green colored, so if this query is given as a sample to retrieve similar faces. Our system retrieves this as the first correct query and these are the other queries which are of lower rank. So the first one is correct. Uh, okay. Uh, here we are rank wise retrieval. So the, the red ones basically show that these are false retrieval. So all these faces are correctly retrieved by this sample. If you ask me B and E with the second 
row and the fifth row in any of these two cases are uh, methods which are published in ICML 2014 and all A, C and D are our methods. So you can see that the green here, the green here means there's not false. So th this is one way of visually representing whether your uh, face retrieval results or face retrieval results are correct. The more quantity of results is something like what is called as ROC curves of GR versus FAR. The higher the better. This is our method top on the red. I'm not discussing this because the, currently this work is under review uh, in CVPR 2017. We know the results by probably by month end. And there are lots of other results here, uh, mostly using deep networks. Ours is also a deep network. In fact, the first two, three are all our methods. One of them uses domain adaptation. The other uses uh, uh, deep networks by itself. And the other uses domain adaptation on deep. So these uh, first three are ours and the rest are all prior works. We have compared with uh, about one dozen or more such methods. Over two databases, I'm showing over two. Then in fact, we have used three serverless databases to compare our results. Okay, the last work here uh, to talk about, we, talk, we are also trying to work on human activity categorization and recognition from videos and the problems line with uh, when there's camera motion, the videos are jittery or there's a background clutter or multiple moving objects. And the recent work basically uh, used, we have been talking about deep all throughout in this uh, conference as well, workshop as well, 3D CNN, LSTM, and uh, two stream CNN. So we actually proposed a variation of these two CNN with an adaptive fusion. Again, I am uh, skipping the details for the lack of time as well as the, um, uh, we have, uh, the paper is under review. So if I just play this video, it will give you an idea of what the deep network is trying to do. So these are the two videos of two different actions. I think this is hip hop and this is fencing or sword fighting sort of a thing. So these are the green areas which actually highlight the activity areas as detected by the deep network. So it's something similar to what you do when you are tapping neurons and trying to find out the signal activities. Uh, so the, it shows basically that the network is able to identify the correct areas where actions are taking place and suppressing the areas where there is no movement or background information sort of thing. Okay, so this is just a visual interpretation of the result, uh, illustration basically. And uh, this is another result uh, in which we compared our work with a recent paper which actually shown, this is the same video, frames of this particular video of the hip hop and it's showing that the white areas are basically the areas where there is activity taking place which is not correct. Our method detects the green areas which are actually better. Okay, so this appeared in archive 2015, but I think it got published somewhere in, if I'm not wrong, in NIFT 2016 paper is what we are beating. I'll come back to this. If you look at the category of results, so we have compared with about again one dozen different methods. Our method is here. I just lift it up for the sake of those. And this is the best uh, which we are beating, uh, which appeared in NIFT 2016 uh, as given here. Okay, so um, this is what uh, uh, it's all about, if you go back to the previous one, this basically shows that our fusion technology is working here. These are activities of uh, bow and arrow and hair combing and all that. So if you just concentrate, let us say this pair or maybe the pair here, the green color shows that after fusion that the activity is near the here where the activity is taking place and not somewhere else. So this basically is, was illustrated to show that our network is actually picking up the response very well. So these are the two latest work which are under review. Currently to wind up, just the rest of you are just visual illustrations of various types of past activities. Uh, I have just talked about uh, brain modeling, then we talked about the current work under review on face recognition from surveillance and video categorization. Uh, okay, this is an illustration which I show everywhere. One of these columns is a ground truth, the other is done by a computer algorithm. This got published in an IEEE transaction journal paper. So, which we made our own databases of satellite images of urban net network. Um, okay, so I ask you to find out which is ground truth and obviously there's little difference, but it's almost, uh, the, the accuracy is around 1995, 92 or so. Overall on a database about 100 images. So how many, I won't give you much time. How many feel this is computer? Raise your hand. One, two. One, two. How many are confident that this is computer? That is a little bit more. So I've got 10 of them. The rest are silent. It's okay, neutral. So let's, let's see. And I'll explain why visually it is so. Yeah, this is ground truth. And this is computers. Okay, so the second guy is correct. So when a human operator takes a brush, Okay, you can see that the brush will actually have a uniform weight and it will miss things like these. 
this cannot be drawn by the usual by the human hand. So, so if you look at certain uh, things, there are other type of uh, 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 marks also which one can identify. The, the human being will not be able to make these small undulations sort of thing. This is the computer will do that, find small variations. But anyway, this is just to show that how close we are. We are about, about on an average 90 percent. This is just one example. Remember, these these images are ab about quite few. Yeah, 2010 to 2012 satellite images. Now the resolution has even gone up, and they're all available, downloaded from Wikimapia or something like that. Google Earth, I'm sorry, I think Google Earth. Okay. So these were probably one meter resolution those days. Now we have sub-pixel. Okay. Let me look at another illustration. So I have finished my talk with just a couple of illustrations here. Maybe this is probably the last one. Let's have a look at this. This is the visualization, other side of my story. There are four guys moving around. You have to find out which two. My students know the answers. Please silent. Be silent. There are two virtual characters and the two real characters. Which two are real or virtual? The quality of the image is not good. This was done by an MS student and finished in 2012. He's writing antivirus in a company in Chennai, so it's okay. There are two virtual and two real characters. So, <clears throat> so this is 3D video composition. If you're taking more time, that means this, the algorithm is quite good. No, tell me the color of the dress. Purple and the black are virtual. Uh, how do you know that? <laughs> the quality is bad. That's one way. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that's why the, the journal rejected our paper, but we got accepted in a conference. Uh, I'll tell a nice story about that. No, no, no. Yeah, you're very close to that. Uh, when we were small children and we grew up, usually our grandmas tell a story that ghosts never have shadows. Look at that. Look, have a look at that. Ghosts never had shadows. Okay, look at the realistic guys, they have shadows on both sides. Okay, all our MS, XMS students from our lab. Okay, <coughs> yeah, all our MS. Fine. And, and the, the question is, how do you create that? Just give me a time here. So, these are what we call as source videos. I hope my most systems go down when we play parallel six videos. So, these were source videos. So, the task was to plug out a source object moving in a source and insert it in 3D in the target video without much of knowledge. Make some assumptions about depth and stuff like that and make it apparent so they don't collide. So it's possible to take you and mix it in a video where, well, Osama is not there, maybe Azhar or somebody else could be moving in a video somewhere in the plateaus of Afghanistan, Kashmir. Talk of virtual reality in a domain where we make, want to make things realistic, so that that's possible. So uh, the, that's all. So just these were the three inputs and this was one mixing. This was a double mixing which I was just showing here. Okay. So this was a couple of conference papers. Not. Uh, I think, I don't know how much time I have. I think I'll skip this and uh, this because that was not visually. So these are my future technical areas of work, including brain modeling and neural activity. We're looking at uh, uh, novel um, deep learning algorithms for visual representation, categorization, re retrieval, uh, and silence detection, as well as do the same thing for images using quantitative modeling combined with domain adaptation. We are looking at also biometric, including multi-biometric multi uh, for recognizing humans and uh, image and video annotations is the state of the art. That means now we are given an image and video. I think there was a demonstration by one of the morning talks with output was sentence uh, coming out, uh, given an input. So this is probably one of the uh, high-end tasks of machine learning. And uh, just trying to find out some virtuality applications of e-trial for apparel fitting. These were some of my sponsors. Uh, very lately, of course, uh, Professor Pakta has been uh, supporting with data and other things. And if you have any questions, that's the end of it. There's a small demo. Let it go on while a couple of minutes or one minute maybe we can have. This is a, you call it a Lauren and Hardy video. Synthesis and graphics. You can have a look at it. And if there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer. This is human locomotion. And we're trying to generate stable movement of a person in general, if two objects hit, one should have fallen, but we install the stability in the system by making joints uh, much more flexible and some parts of the body soft and stuff like that. So this goes on for a minute or so, a little bit more, and, but uh, open to questions. <laughs> any, questions? any questions? Comments? Yeah, I know. It's staring at that. This is not a correct way of... <laughs> yeah. No, this is the control point. So the user is controlling the movement. Uh, so this is an interactive video. Uh, 
this is basically like a game tool. So the user can control the, so you can move switch from one character to the other. To that. See, this fellow will not fall. He'll go back and then pass its way out. So you want to turn around and make the bodies clash again. So this is just indicated where the control point of the user. So this is basically interactive. Sort of game environment, but our main idea was to do human modeling uh, locomotion. So this was done by an MTech student about two years back. A couple of small local conference papers. Yeah, thank you.